This video is going to introduce the cardiovascular and lymphatic systems, and then we're going to talk about um, a couple different diseases that affect these systems, but they are going to be more general diseases, and then future videos for this series will talk about more specific um, and unique diseases that have their own specific signs and symptoms and causative agents. Okay, so let's first, oops, sorry, there we go. Let's first review the cardiovascular system, which is also called the circulatory system, which is going to be a closed system, meaning that it's axenic, okay, so no normal microbiota associated with it. Um, and this network of vessels and organs is going to be moving blood all around the body in order to deliver things like oxygen, nutrients, um, immune cells, and things like that to tissues and carry away uh, waste products so they can be eliminated from the body. And so the heart is going to be a key player for this system. And so we're going to talk about a couple of diseases um, affecting the heart. Um, but we're also going to be talking about the lymphatic system, um, which is going to also be uh, comprised of vessels that are going to run throughout the body. Um, but these vessels, you know, are different, okay? They're not, um, you know, completely circulating the body. Um, they're not really pressurized by the heart. Um, but instead, <clears throat> excuse me, this system it's going to be an open system, okay, with fluid moving um, in a single direction from the extremities, okay, towards um, two different drainage points into veins above the heart. And so, you know, lymph, which is going to be that fluid, is going to, um, you know, carry things like uh, or contain things like lysozyme and antibodies, complement proteins and other important immune factors um, that we've already talked about. So let's go ahead and get into um, some of these diseases. Um, so again, these are just kind of more general diseases affecting these systems. Um, so first, uh, blood is typically axenic, right? So no normal microbiota there, but it's not terribly difficult for pathogens to gain access uh, to the blood, right? Cuts in the skin, breaches in mucous membranes. Um, if these, you know, two body systems that we're talking about fail, uh, microbes are able to not only get into the blood, but start replicating in the blood, okay? And so this can lead to sepsis. And essentially, sepsis is going to be um, the body's extreme response to an existing infection, and it can be life-threatening. So as we've talked about, right, a, an infection is going to trigger our immune response, right, these ch as chain reaction of responses in our body. Um, and sometimes things don't always go according to plan. And, you know, there can be an overabundance of, you know, cytokines released that are going to trigger things like infection. Um, and if it's left untreated, it can result in tissue damage, organ failure, and death. So many times, sepsis is associated with um, existing bacterial infections, but it can occur with you know, viral infections and infections from other types of pathogens as well. Um, a lot of times, the infection that either leads to sepsis or actual sepsis itself is actually going to um, occur outside of hospital settings. Sepsis is communicable. I'm sorry, is not communicable. Sorry about that. Sepsis is not communicable, but the infection the person has might be communicable. Okay, so um, we still try to avoid contamination. Um, and if any of the signs and symptoms associated with um, sepsis are observed, immediate action should be taken because um, Septicemia, which is when there are pathogens replicating in the blood, can lead to septic shock. And we're going to talk about that, uh, sign and symptoms associated with that here in just a second. So what are some of the 
um, signs and symptoms of uh, you know, sepsis and septicemia. Well, that is going to be um, extreme pain or discomfort, uh, shortness of breath, a high heart rate, or low blood pressure. Um, oftentimes, the skin will be you know, clammy or sweaty. Um, the patient is sometimes disoriented or is experiencing bouts of um, confusion, and oftentimes like a, a fever, right, which can have things like shivering or actually feeling very cold. So that is going to be um, some key indicators that you need to be considering septicemia. Um, and like I said, that can progress to septic shock. And really, septic shock is characterized by this really sudden decrease um, in blood pressure. And that's going to be because of um, the dilation of blood vessels. And so associated with that are going to be you know, decreased uh, urine output, uh, rapid breathing, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, blood clotting, um, anxiety, and like I said, it can result in death. Um, another uh, condition that is sometimes observed is going to be lymphangitis, which is inflammation of the lymphatic channels. And again, this is going to be as a result of a pre-existing infection. And um, you can easily identify uh, lymphangitis because you tend to see this red streak that is at the surface of the skin uh, that starts at the infected area and kind of traces the route to the nearest lymph gland. And um, in this picture, the red streak is pretty bold. Sometimes it is much more faint, um, but again, it's gonna go from the site of infection uh, to the nearest lymph gland. All right, so um, the bacterial infections of the heart. So, um, when we are thinking about the um, anatomy of the heart, okay, um, endocarditis and pericarditis are two infections of the heart. So let's start with um, endocarditis. That's going to be inflammation of the endocardium, which is going to be the um, lining inside of the heart uh, chambers. And so with endocarditis, the pathogen is going to get into the bloodstream. It's going to infect the lining of the heart. And this can result in the pathogen growing on the heart valves, which can then spread outside of the heart and blood vessels. So uh, there is subacute endocarditis and acute endocarditis. So we know that when we see the term acute, that means the signs and symptoms are going to come on strong, but then also, um, you know, sometimes can can you know go away pretty quickly. But now we're talking about the heart, right? And so with acute, um, it can lead to rapid destruction of the heart valves. And look at the cause of agents, that pesky bacteria Staphylococcus aureus, right? So we talked about it already with the skin. Now we're seeing it um, causing issues with um, our cardiovascular system, and we will see it affecting other body systems as well. Now with subacute, um, endocarditis that is going to gradual um, develop gradually and which means it can um, occur slowly over a couple of weeks even a couple of months and as you can see um, <clears throat> excuse me basically this condition is really serious because and I mean like endocarditis in general because white blood cells that normally travel in your bloodstream can't necessarily reach these heart valves right so treating this type of infection can be pretty challenging um, and when we're trying to diagnose endocarditis you know there are going to be those um, common non-specific signs and symptoms like malaise and fever and chills and fatigue but there are some um, other, you know, more unique signs and symptoms, uh, which is going to uh, include things like swelling of the feet, the abdomen, or the legs. Um, sometimes a heart murmur can be detected, chest pains uh, every time you breathe, and things like night sweats. Uh, less common are going to be things like blood and present in the urine and unexplained weight loss. Another infection of the heart is going to be uh, pericarditis. Again, itis tells you it's inflammation. 
the pericardi is inflammation of the pericardium, which is this sac-like structure um, that has two thin layers of tissue surrounding the heart um, to kind of hold it in place and help it work. And normally there's going to be this thin layer of fluid in between the tissues to minimize friction as the heart beats. But with pericarditis, um, basically this arises due to infected layers of the pericardium rubbing against each other. And so although the disease is generally mild and can go away on its own without any type of treatment, the symptoms are not pleasant. Okay. Um, oftentimes, um, pericarditis is going to result in this sharp stabbing pain, uh, normally on the left side of the chest and or behind the breastbone. And that uh, sharp stabbing feeling is actually intensified if the person lies down, coughs, you know, or takes like a deep breath. And in order to kind of alleviate that pain, um, the individual would need to either lean forward or sit down. All right, so those are just the, the general conditions that we're wanted, or I wanted us to talk about. Uh, now we're gonna start getting into more specific diseases um, that are gonna have you know, very unique signs and symptoms. So stay tuned for that. Let me know if you have any questions.